The objects of the world don't contain happiness, nor do the people. We experience happiness from those things if we are attached to them, or if we have a great desire for them. The greater the desire, the greater the happiness we get upon meeting with them. Same goes with attachment. And then, as we go on enjoying that thing, the desire decreases, so the enjoyment decreases as well. And the very same things that we get happiness from can also give us pain if they are taken away from us or if someone we love says something hurtful. That's more hurtful than someone, a total stranger, saying something hurtful to us. We won't even care. We'll say, who are you to me? That doesn't bother me. But it's someone that we're attached to, that hurts. So we feel this happiness and unhappiness based on our own thinking not because there is actual happiness or unhappiness in the things or people of this world. Therefore, it can't be said to be real happiness. But real happiness does exist in God. In fact, God is the substantial existence of happiness. Even in Swarg, because Swarg or the celestial abodes is part of this mayic expansion. It's also made by the mayic energy. So over there, even though the happiness, or you can say the pleasures, are many times greater than the pleasures here, but they're of the same quality, meaning they're temporary, and that's not real happiness either. It's just experience based on our desires, not on the actual existence of happiness. And Swarg itself, being under Maya, is a temporary place. It is also destroyed when the universe is dissolved. So Swarg is not God. Swarg is not God's divine abode. So there's no permanent divine happiness over there either. So since Arjun was not desiring worldly happiness of the earth nor of Swarg, so Sri Krishna told him about Karma Yoga. He said there's a way to do both, meaning you can physically perform your duty, yet you won't be bound by it. That's the key with Karma Yoga, is that you can perform your duty. But what makes it karma yoga is that you're not attached to anything in the world. You should be attached to God. That's what makes it karma yoga. Our attachment is what is binding. So if we do any good action in the world with attachment in that thing, or attachment to the outcome, what are we personally going to gain from that? That's a binding action. So binding means that it produces a result and even if it's a good result, we have to be reborn in order to receive that result. So we're binding ourselves to be reborn again under Maya in the cycle of birth and death. So even good actions are binding, but they are not binding if they're done without attachment. So in other words, it's not the physical action that's binding. It's only the attachment of our mind that's binding. And that attachment of our mind is our own choice. We can choose to attach our mind to God or to the world. And attaching our mind to God is in fact the best way to make sure that we can do our worldly duties properly. We'll learn more about that today when we discuss the rest of the second chapter and also the third chapter. So Sri Krishna explained Karma Yoga in brief in the second chapter saying that if someone is able to perform their actions without desire for any worldly reward because of even performing a good action and without attachment but with the mind attached in God then they will be freed from the effects of those actions they won't be bound and in fact they can attain God they can attain divine bliss through doing such karma yoga because you get the result of what you're attached to. So even if you're doing good actions in the world, but if your mind is attached to God, you will attain God. 
It's like, uh, let's say, a husband and wife have three daughters. And they get their three daughters married to three different people. So let's say the first, the, the uh, eldest daughter got married to a millionaire. But the millionaire had some bad habits, maybe he had a gambling habit or a drinking habit, and he ended up losing everything. So it means he became a beggar, she also became a beggar along with him. The second daughter got married to an ordinary person, and he just stayed ordinary his whole life. So meaning they just had enough to get by, and that was fine. And the the youngest daughter, she got married to someone who was ordinary, but he became a millionaire. So she also became a millionaire along with him. This is how attachment works. Whatever you attach your mind to, that's what you attain. So, even though it is your duty to take care of your children, and by take care, I mean, I'm not going to go into too much detail tonight. I don't mean that you are responsible 100% for how they turn out. You're not. You're responsible to guide them and discipline them and educate them, but you can't control them. After a certain age, certainly, they're going to do what they want. And it's simply your duty to guide and, and help and Try, try your best to send them in a good direction. <clears throat> That's your duty. But if your mind is attached to them, what is the outcome of that according to the Gita? Let's say, again, let's say someone has a son who is Thomas in nature. It's not your fault, you try your best but they make bad decisions, and they think bad thoughts, and the, the quality of their mind is thomas. So then, someone who lives their whole life like that, they're going to be reborn in the lower species, or perhaps even have to go to Narak for some time because of their wrong actions. So if we are attached to such a person, what happens to us? We're reborn according to our attachments. So even though you ser serving them or taking care of them, that was your duty. But it wasn't your duty to attach your mind to them. So what outcome do you get? You get the attachment of your mind. If wherever they go, you're going to go too. Same goes with your parents. It is your duty to serve and support your parents. But it's not your duty to attach your mind to them. Because who knows? They may go to Swarag, they may be reborn in this world, they may be reborn in the lower species, we don't know. It's according to their state of mind at their time of death. Sattvic, Rajas, Thomas, accordingly they're reborn. So karma yoga means doing the duty without the attachment. That the danger is not in doing the duty. The danger is in the attachment. So keep the attachment of the mind in God You'll be rewarded with God realization. What could be better? And at the same time, you were still creating harmony in the family and the society by doing all the physical good actions and performing your duties. So here Arjun asks Krishna a question. <clears throat> what is that person like who has attained you? He uses the term sthita pragya which means someone whose mind is perfectly established in God. Attachment comes in degrees. You may be 90% attached in the world and 10% attached to God. And then as you practice devotion and you practice karma yoga, gradually your attachment to God builds. So you may be 50-50, you may be 75-25. Eventually you get to 100% attachment in God and that's when you're called God-realized. You become God-realized when you become 100% attached to God. So Arjuna is asking, the one whose mind is perfectly established in you is Sthita Pragya. So what is such a person like? Describe him for me. How does he walk? How does he talk? How does he sit? 
So Krishna, hearing Arjun's question, wanted to tell him something about a sthitapragya person, but he didn't answer, in fact, how does he walk, or how does he talk, or how does he sit, because those are external things. Just like I was talking that you can have your mind attached to God and be physically doing your duty in the world, so how can you tell even if someone's mind is 100% attached in God? Their physical actions won't give you any clue as to their, their inner status or their inner state. So in describing this uh, God-realized saint, Sri Krishna said a few interesting things about his internal state. He didn't tell anything about externally. Prajahatiyadakaman sarvan parthmanogatan atmanyevatmanatushta sthita pragyastadochyate He says the one who has no desires all of his desires have been finished, and he's completely self-content. That person is Thita Pragya. Why would he have no desires? Because he attained God. All of our desires are only due to our desire for happiness. There is no desire that anyone can have which is for any other reason other than they want to be happy. So in fact, you can say that we only have one desire, to be perfectly happy forever. That covers everything. There's nothing left out. And where is perfect happiness? In God. Raso vai rasagvam hyevayam labhvanandi bhavati. Taittiriya Upanishad says, God is perfect happiness. And only by attaining Him can a soul become anandi. Anandi means blissful. God is anand. Anando brahmeti vijana. So God is anand and we can become full of that anand if we attain Him. There's no other way. So when someone has attained God, they've attained perfect happiness of unlimited amount. So now what do they have to do but enjoy it? There's nothing left to desire for, all they have to do is enjoy it forever. So there's no desire remaining in the heart of a God-realized saint. So he's self-complacent, self-contented. He has divine bliss right here, so he doesn't need a thing from anybody or anything from this world. Vihaya kamanya sarvan umanj charatini spriha nirmamo nirahankara sashanti madhiga chati. Another verse describing more of the same thing. He has no desires. He doesn't long for anything in this world. He's, he doesn't feel restless to attain anything in this world. He has no attachment to anything or anyone, and he has no ahankar. He doesn't feel false pride, he doesn't feel arrogance, vanity, he's beyond all of that. He has no fear, he has perfect control over his mind. This is the definition of a sthita pragya, God-realized saint. Vishaya vini vartante niraha rasya dehina rasavarjam rasopyasya param drishtva nivartate. In this verse, Sri Krishna says something very important. He says that up until God realization, a person will have worldly desires. So a person may control from the outside. A person may physically renounce things, but from inside they will still have some amount of worldly desire right up until God-realization. Param drishtva nivartate. Param means God, the Supreme. Drishtva, when you see God, that means God-realization. God-realization means God comes to you. 
you see him. So param drishtva nivartate. All of your desires are finished the moment you meet God, not before then. So it's a caveat to Arjun, meaning he's warning him that a person may act renounced in this world. You're asking for the characteristics of a saint. How does he walk? How does he talk? How does he sit? So Krishna is indirectly saying, don't try to judge who is a saint and who isn't by how they walk or talk or sit, because a worldly person can act renounced. A worldly person can try to act from the outside like they have no desires. Yet from inside, this machine is still running, because until you attain God, you have desires. And on the other hand, Ragadveshaviyuktaistu Vishayan Indriyaish Jaran Atma Vashyair Vidhe Atma Sashanti Madhigachati The one who has no desires from inside, he still engages his senses with the objects of the world. Vishayan Indri Aish Charan. Charan means his Indriya, his senses. They're still actively engaged in the worldly things. He eats, he sleeps, he takes medicine, he looks at a beautiful scene. If he eats a, some food, he may say, oh, that tastes good, or that tastes bad. So, his senses are still engaged in all the worldly objects. From outside, that's how it seems to us. But from inside, raga dvesha biyuktaistu. He has no rag or dvesh. Rag means loving attachment, and dvesh means negative or hateful attachment. Both are forms of attachment. So who has no rag and no dvesh? The one who has attained God. So the saint, the sthita pragya saint, has no attachment to anything, yet he's still making use of everything. So now look at the two. Krishna is saying on one hand, a person with worldly desires may deny himself the objects of the senses and try to act like he has no desires, but from inside all the desires are there. And then you have a saint who's behaving normally in the world. Yet from inside he has no desires. So in other words, Arjun, don't try to judge by what you see from the outside. There was a saint during the time of Chaitanya Mahaprabhuji named Pundarika Vidyanidhi. Pundarika Vidyanidhi was very wealthy. So wealthy you would think, you know, he, he had more prosperity than a king. One day, Chaitanya Mahaprabhuji, 500 years ago, Mahaprabhuji was the dissension of Radha Krishna in the form of a saint. So he went to visit Pundarika Vidyanidhi and he took some of his disciples with him. So as they entered, some, a couple of his disciples, one in particular, got very confused seeing Pundarika Vidyanidhi. At first he was thinking, because Mahaprabhuji had said, Let's go and visit a great saint. And then when they entered and he saw, oh, he's sitting on a golden throne and he's got people uh, serving him and fanning him and, you know, serving him in gold thalis. And uh, he's living it up more than a king would. This person must be more worldly even than I am. Why is Mahaprabhuji calling him a great saint? So he got confused doing exactly what Sri Krishna just told us not to. Don't look at the outer things. A saint may be a great king, Prahlad, for instance. Prahlad became God-realized at the age of seven. And after God-realization, he got married, had kids, became king, and ruled for thousands of years. Is it possible for a person to do that who doesn't have any desire? If you don't have a desire, why would you get married? With no desire, how could you have kids? With no greed, why would you want to rule a kingdom for that long? Yet, 
he was God realized. From inside he had no greed, no lust, no desire, nothing. Yet he did all of those things. We have many examples like King Janak, Ambarish, Dhruv. These are all kings who were saints, Rajarshis we call them. So we can't judge from the outside. Inside, someone may be anything. We don't know. My Guruji, Kripaluji Maharaj, says that no matter how bad a person see, seems from the outside, you should never dislike them from your heart. You may say what they're doing is wrong. That, that's fine. You may decide not to do, not to imitate their behavior. But you should never have voyage for even someone you think is a bad person. Because you don't know what's in their heart. Look at Ravan. Who was Ravan? Ravan was a descended divine personality, Jay, from Vaikunth abode, an eternal servant of Mahavishnu. Yet, if we had seen Ravan during the time of Ram's descension, we would have probably had Dvesh for him. We would have been saying what a bad person he is and how can you treat Bhagwan Ram like that. In other words, we would have hated him. And our hate would have been misplaced because he was simply a divine personality playing the part of a demon. So we can't know the situation of anybody's inner heart. So the safest approach is just be neutral to everybody. No rag, no dvesh. See Bhagawan Shri Krishna in the heart of every person. So if you want to be attached to someone, be attached to Krishna who resides in the heart of that person. Don't be attached to that person. This is what a saint feels. The saint has compassion for every soul, seeing that every soul has Shri Krishna within him. But he's not attached in the way that we get attached. So in the end, Sri Krishna says to Arjun that the saint is no longer deluded by the hopes of this world. We live in hope. It's like we're in a dream. Krishna says the saint is awake and we are sleeping. We're sleeping in like a, like a stupor a stupor of worldly attachment and intoxication. We're not wrong to desire happiness, but we've been desiring happiness from this world for so long, for so many lifetimes, that now that, that attachment to the world has gone so deeply into our heart, we can't even see anything else. All we know is our desire for this world. So we're intoxicated with those worldly desires and attachments. It means we can't discriminate properly. Our mind, our intellect does not discriminate properly and see that, oh, this world is always disappointing me. It never gives me real satisfaction. Real satisfaction is in God. Our mind doesn't see that. That's why we need the Gita to point it out to us. And we need saints to keep coming on the earth planet and guiding us in that direction towards God. But the saint is completely awake from this dream, from this illusion. And he will never be fooled again. For the saint, the pleasures of the world are like a, like a puddle next to an ocean. The saint has the unlimited ocean of divine bliss. And the pleasures of this world next to God's divine bliss, they're like a puddle next to the ocean. So the saint has no need for anything from this world. Esha brahmi sthiti partha nainam prapya vimukhyati You will never be deluded by this world again. And in the end, Antakali bi Brahma Nirvana Nirchati. He enters into God and stays in divine bliss forever. And this is the end of the second chapter. In the beginning of the third chapter, Arjuna asks, Krishna, if all of this is true, and I'm just paraphrasing, of course, 
giving you the sense behind what Arjun is asking. If all of this Sankhya philosophy is true, that worldly pleasures are temporary, my true identity is the soul, so I'm truly related to you, not to this world. Knowing all of that, then why are you still pushing me into this horrible war which is about to take place? When what I want is divine happiness, why do I still have to fight this war? It's a natural thing to wonder. So Krishna tells him, Arjun, you can't attain that divine state just by becoming physically inactive or ignoring or, or physically renouncing all of your physical actions and duties. Someone doesn't become God-realized just by taking sannyas. Taking sannyas means renouncing all the physical karmas. Anyway, Arjun, Sharire yatra pichate na prasiddheda karmana You can't renounce all the physical actions. If you do that, you won't even be able to support your own body. Even a sannyasi has to do something for his body. So don't think that you can attain your ultimate goal simply by physical renunciation. Again, same as the last chapter, Sri Krishna tells him, Karmendriyani sanyamya yaaste manasas maran Indriyairthan vimurhatma mithyachara sa ujjate some people control their senses from the outside, but from inside they keep desiring the world. So, that person is a fool, Krishna says. He's a mithyachari. He's a hypocrite. In effect, we're all hypocrites to some degree, up until God-realization. We are, because we want God, and we say we want God, and we act like we want God. Yet from inside, we are still desiring the world. We chant God's name. Yet from inside, we still have worldly desires. So up until God-realization, we all remain somewhat hypocritical, becoming less and less so as we progress on the path. But the point Sri Krishna is making is that it's not... It's neither here nor there, Arjun, whether you fight this war or don't fight the war. That has nothing to do with whether you're going to attain divine happiness. Because your attainment of divine happiness is dependent upon attaching your mind to God. That's it. Physically deciding to fight the war or physically going to the jungle, that has no effect on whether you're going to attain God or not. Therefore, Mai sarvani karmani sanyasya dhyatma chetasa jahi shatrum mahabaho yudhyasva vigata jvara. Therefore, Arjun, dedicating all of your actions to me, attach your mind to me and fight the war, giving up this emotional tur turmoil that you're experiencing. Just put that aside, attach your mind to me, and offer the good action of fighting the war to me. That's it. Just do your duty, offering it all to me with your mind attached to me, and then you will come to me. End of story. King Janak is given as an example by Sri Krishna in this, in this chapter. He says, King Janak ruled the kingdom for years with his mind in God the whole time. So Arjun, you can also do this action of fighting the war and keep your mind in me. Then Arjun asked a question related to our mind, because Krishna is talking a lot about the internal state, about desires and attachment 
and greed and anger and all of these things. So Arjun thought, Krishna, why is it that people do wrong things even if they know it's wrong? So Krishna said, the answer is very simple. Kama esha krodha esha rajoguna samabhava. Kam is the culprit, desire, worldly desire. And worldly desire which leads to krodh, anger. So both desire and anger can lead a person to do wrong things, even when they know it's wrong. Indriyani mano buddhi rasya dhishthanam ujjate. Now here's something scientific for you to understand. Where does desire come from? Shri Krishna says, desire is born of Rajoguna. Maya has three qualities, Sattva, Raj, Tam, three gunas of Maya. So everything Mayak has these three qualities inherent in them, like inborn qualities. And it so happens that our mind is made of Maya. Our identity, our personal identity, is partly divine and partly mayak. Because although our true self, the soul, is divine, yet our mind and body are made of maya. So our mind has sattva rajtam. Or in fact, it doesn't just have sattva rajtam, it is sattva rajtam. Let's say we had a cloth that was woven from three different types of thread. White thread, red thread, and black thread. That's sattva raj tam. According to Ved, Ved, Ved refers to these three qualities with three colors. Sattva being white, raj being red, and tam being black. So if we wove a cloth out of those three qualities, could we remove one of the colors of thread, or two of the colors of thread, and keep one? No, as soon as you pull the thread, the whole thing comes apart. So the material itself is made of the threads. Similarly, our mind itself is made of sattva tam. Saying it's made of maya and saying it's made of sattva tam is the same thing. And the raj, that, that's the quality that gives us selfish ambition worldly desires to enjoy the world in a selfish way. The sattva gun, that gives us the more generous, compassionate, peaceful, spiritual qualities. And tamo gun makes us lazy and messy and, and uh, evil. So this rajogun, the effect of that in the mind is worldly desire. Shri Krishna's point is that your mind itself is made of Rajaguna. So the desire comes out of that naturally, automatically. And if your desire for a worldly thing is strong enough, then even if you know it's wrong to do a certain thing, because of your desire, you may decide to do that wrong thing anyway. A thief does that all the time. I know it's wrong to steal, but I don't care because I want it, so I'm going to take it. And then, as we learned yesterday, if you have a desire for something and that desire is not fulfilled, that can lead to anger. And we all know that under the effect of anger, we can do many wrong things. So Sri Krishna says the culprit is, in fact, the gunas of maya, which give rise to things like desire and anger, and those things cause us to do wrong things even when we know it's wrong. <coughs> so how to remove these things from the mind? Well, you can't. They're an inborn part of your mind. But there is, a, there is something you can consider. Indriyani paranyahu indriyebhya paramana Manasastu para buddhir yo buddhe paratastu sa. Beyond your mind is your soul. 
and beyond your soul is God. So God is beyond your mind and God is beyond Maya and God is divine. So it means God is beyond Mayak qualities. He's beyond Sattva Raj Tam. So what the, the very, uh, at the end of the third chapter, Shri Krishna tells Arjun, Evam buddhe param buddhva sanstabhyatma manatmana jahi shatrum mahabaho kamarupam durasadam Arjun, you can defeat this undefeatable enemy of calm, worldly desire. You can defeat it. Jahi Shatrum. Kill this enemy. Calm. How? Attach your mind to what is beyond your mind. It's like a puzzle. He's saying, God is beyond your mind. And God is beyond Sattva Rajtam, being beyond Maya. So if you could attach your mind to God, then your mind would go beyond Sattva Rajtam. Then you'd be free of calm, krodh, just like that Sthita Pragya Mahapurush. But it's a puzzle because how do you attach your mind to that which is beyond your mind? By very definition, God is beyond the mind. You can conceive of the things that are under Maya. <clears throat> if something is under Maya, you can think of it because your mind is also made of Maya. How can you think of God? God is not Mayak. God is divine. So with a Mayak mind, how will you think of divine God? And if you can't think of Him, how will you attach your mind to Him? And if you can't attach your mind to Him, how will you purify your mind and go beyond sattva rajtam so that you can go beyond all these defilements of the mind which cause us to do wrong things? So it looks like we're stuck. It looks like the solution is not a solution at all. It's like telling someone who's dying of thirst in the desert, who's surrounded by hundreds of miles of sand with no water in sight, and telling them, if you could find water, you won't die of thirst. So if you could attach your mind to God, all of your problems would go away. But how to attach the mind to God when God is beyond the mind? We get this answer in the fourth chapter, which we're going to learn about tomorrow. So that's my cliffhanger for you, so you have to come back tomorrow.